So I've been asked to give a talk this evening on the topic of emptiness. That's it. Right. <laughs> How can you improve on the thing itself? So that's that's the talk on emptiness. Now comes the commentary. Right. <laughs> Try to improve on perfection. <clears throat> uh, emptiness. When I saw my teacher, Ajahn Mahachachai, in Bangkok a few years ago, and he he spoke to me about emptiness, and he said that don't uh, misunderstand by thinking that emptiness means um, like nothing or nothingness. He said actually emptiness is um, complete fullness or consummation. He used the word boribun, which means it's complete. So... I always remember that. It's kind of pointing to a very um, uh, um, central aspect of the whole idea of emptiness is is that it's ambivalent. It's ambiguous. Emptiness is ambiguous. And, of course, emptiness is symbolized by the number zero. Yeah? So you have the number zero, which on the one hand is just a hole, isn't it? Like a zero, it's just a hole, there's nothing to it. But on the other hand, it's completely full. Yeah? It's a circle, it encompasses everything. So the, the symbol of the circle can be a symbol for wholeness and completion, yeah? and, a, and a symbol for nothingness. And the other thing that zero stands for is that zero is uh, like on the, on the cusp. So it's in between the positive numbers and the negative numbers. And you have this kind of zero there, which is neither positive nor negative. And one of the interesting things about zero, of course, is that zero uh, had to be invented. Because numbers are concepts. Numbers don't exist in the world. You don't go wandering through the forest and find a group of five trees with the number five written on them. Right? You don't discover number. You invent them. It's a human concept. And... Uh, Zero is a very unobvious concept. You don't think about it. And to us, it's so it's, we learnt it at primary school, so we couldn't imagine what the world would be like if there was no zero. But that's actually how it was. And, and in the whole Roman mathematical system, there wasn't a zero. And the Western mind never thought of the idea of zero. And uh, in the, the medieval <coughs> European Mathematicians learnt about zero from the Arabs, and the Arabs in turn learnt it from the Indians, and the Indians learnt it from the Buddhists. So the very notion of zero is still called, in Thai the word for zero is sun, which is just taken from the word sunya or sunyata, is emptiness. <coughs> so... Of course, the great thing about zero is that uh, it's it's nothing, but it's very very useful. Yeah. In itself, zero is nothing. But if you put a one in front of it, then it's something. Yeah. And you put lots of zeros, and you get lots more. So, on the one hand, it's nothing, but on the other hand, it's very meaningful. So this is very kind of interesting, isn't it? One way of thinking about that paradox is to think of emptiness as being the nothing that makes everything possible. So nothing that makes everything possible. And uh, that's true on a very literal uh, scale. Only when there's nothing is something possible. If we want to write on a piece of paper, we can only make sense if we're writing on a blank piece of paper. Yeah? 
once we've filled it up with words, we can go and write on the same piece of paper again and again and again, and you actually lose meaning. The more you put in there, the more you lose meaning. And so nothingness preserves meaning. Same thing happens in uh, dialogue, communications with people. Yeah, And we've all been in that situation where everyone's shouting at the same time. Yeah, And actually that's in one of the suttas, in the, in the sutta nipata. Everyone, when, when everyone's shouting all at the same time, nobody thinks that they're the fool. Yeah? But the whole bunch of them are all fools. Yeah, So words make sense in space and in silence. That's why when we uh, speak Dhamma, when we, we have a Dhamma talk, we, we create a special space. We create a time when we're not doing other things. Yeah, we create that environment where everyone's quiet, we're not distracted, and in that space the words of Dhamma have a power. It's very different if I was to go and give this same Dhamma talk in uh, in the fish markets, yeah, and try to yell it above the... <laughs> it, would, it would have a slightly different impact. I don't know, maybe you'd have some enlightened fish, I don't know. <clears throat> but, uh, and so it's actually the space that gives things meaning. Yeah? And we know that in our homes too, don't we? Yeah? That uh, it's actually the, the, the space, that's all a home is really. A home is just a constructed space. We give some definition to space. And of course, if we look at a, on a scientific level, on the level of physics, then um, you know, the very structure of atoms is uh, uh, basically energies in space. And if we take the space out of matter, we get a black hole. And ultimately a black hole or the, the, the big crunch at the, the end of the universe is nothing more than matter with the space taken out of it. And there's no space. And because there's no space, everything's jammed up against each other. And the whole matter in the universe is jammed up and fits into just a tiny little fly speck. Tiny little speck like that. And everything in the whole universe is there. You can put it in your pocket, take it around the place, everything's there. And of course the fact that everything's there means that nothing's there. Yeah? Once you've packed the universe up into tight, such a tight little thing, there's no universe anymore. Yeah? Where's it gone? Where's the history gone? Where's the people gone? Where's the, the meaning gone? Where's the life gone? It's, it's gone. It's, there's nothing there. Everything's there and nothing's there. There's just sheer density. And that density, that lack of space or lack of emptiness, doesn't. we can't imagine it because when we imagine it, we imagine it as if that's like a little speck which is floating around in space. Okay, But that's not how it is at all. Space itself is folded up into that little speck. Light itself is folded up into that speck. The laws of physics are folded, folded up into that speck. There is nothing outside of that speck. Okay, We try to imagine that. Try to put your mind in that. There's just that little speck. Everything in the universe is in there and there's nothing outside it. You can't step back from it and look at it. There's nothing outside to step back. So what this shows us is that space or emptiness is, uh, is uh, in that sense, in a physical sense, is dependent Okay. It's actually dependent on something. You have to have two somethings, and you say the space between them is X, Y, Z. Yeah. But the space itself is dependent. And at the beginning of the universe, it's all wrapped up into one little speck. And then boom! explodes and space is created again, the universe is created again, the laws of physics start working, light starts moving, gravity starts having its effect, all of those things. None of them could work there in any recognizable sense. And then they all start again and they start again because of space. So space is operating 
in an interdependent way with every kind of physical phenomenon. Everything, everything that's happening is, in some sense, dependent on space and space is dependent on it. In fact, space is just a concept. Space isn't, doesn't have an essence. And this was the great uh, debate that was raging in 19th century physics and they, they were debating about what they called the ether. And this idea of the ether was that there was an actual medium through which light would propagate. So they thought, well, if you look at, you know, in sound waves propagate through the air, which is a something, the, the waves on the ocean propagate through the water, so light waves must propagate through something, and that's something they call the ether. And they tried to find the ether, but of course the ether doesn't exist. Okay? There's no, space is not a thing, it's not an essence. Okay? It's just a word we use, it's a concept we use when we're talking about the in-betweenness of things. Now, this, this kind of way of thinking about emptiness uh, was developed by the Buddha in uh, one of the discourses called the Chula Sunyata Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. And uh, he talked about emptiness in quite an interesting way and actually developed it as a meditation topic. Okay? So you can actually use emptiness as a meditation subject in just the same way you might use the breath or you might use metta or something like that. And if you want to use emptiness, you can actually meditate. Uh, on emptiness in the same way. And in that sutta, uh, it gave this kind of progressive emptiness. And uh, so the first one, you know, you go into the quiet space to meditate. And then as you're sitting there, you sit there quietly and you reflect, now this space is empty of... And then it listed all of the things, the sounds in the Indian villages at the time. It's empty of elephants. Just like this room is empty of elephants. <laughs> it's empty of the noise of music. It's empty of the shouting of people. It's empty of business. It's empty of uh, traffic. It's empty of houses. And all of those things, they're not here. And so you don't have to worry about them. Yeah? It's empty of all those things. And when you perceive that, that's very simple. It's a very simple reflection. But what that tells you is that, that those things are a something, and the something is uh, stressful. Yeah? Even though there might be, there's nothing wrong with them, even though they might be essential, they might be useful, but still, there's a something there. And letting go of that, ah, there's nothing. There's just this left. What is there? This is the place that I'm sitting here, maybe sitting in the forest, and there's just the, the, the perception of the forest. Or maybe if you're sitting meditation in a room at home, there's just this. I'm just here in my room. I, my perception is this. Maybe you have a shrine, candlelight, and the Buddha Rupa. And there's just that perception of that. That's all I can see. This is this is just that's just what there is. This is what's left. And so then you can then take it to another level. You close your eyes. You can say, "Okay, I'm closing my eyes." Now that visual perception is now gone. This is now empty of those things. What is there? The perception that's left. Well, there's the perception of the the feelings in my body, the thoughts going through my mind, the emotions that I'm feeling. I have these kinds of perceptions. Okay, so the, it's full of these things. Then you can think, well, okay, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let go of the past and the future. And so this, the present moment is now empty of the past and the future, but it still has the present moment. And then within that present moment, we can then focus, for example, on the breathing or on our other meditation object. And we go into that. And the, it's empty of all of those other things. And so on and on and on we go, and the further we go into meditation, the deeper the perception of emptiness. It means that the, 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 the more things are missing, the more things are gone. And of course, what you realize as you do this is that the more things that go, the lighter the mind is and the more happy you are, the more peaceful you are. So this is something which is, of course... 180 degrees contrary to our ordinary way of thinking. Our ordinary way of thinking is the more things we get, the happier we're going to be. Yeah? And uh, 
just just this afternoon we were we were we were we had a meeting at the Buddhist Council and we were walking past this shop and it was a shop selling rugs and it was 85% off. So I said to Chandra, "Wow, imagine how much money we can save. You know, 85%, you can save all that money and get all these rugs. Of course, we don't need any rugs, right?" But we just save so much money on them. <laughs> if we get two, we'll save twice as much, you know. <laughs> and uh, so this is a kind of the worldly way of thinking, isn't it? That you you getting something is good about getting, but of course, getting there's a weight in the mind there, isn't there? Yeah, there's always some kind of weight. You have to carry things around. A kind of weight of ownership. It's so nice not to have anything, you know. And this is one of the loveliest things about being a monk. Is just to, I have to admit, that didn't really make that much difference to me. I never had anything anyway, right? <laughs> so this is, <laughs> except for some guitars. So I got rid of them. So, uh, but I, I can imagine that if I had have had something, that letting go of it would have been, would have been good. <laughs> uh, and to just, you know, to just really feel that that's it, you know. And when you're going, when you're traveling around the place, you know, just to take a very simple bag, you know, just take a bag, a couple of changes of clothes and that's all you need, you know, and just wandering around. And you see people traveling and they take so much stuff and you think, my goodness, what have you got in there? You know, you've got an elephant or what? Yeah. <laughs> just in case, you know. <laughs> and... Uh, a couple of spare albatrosses in there. Or, I, don't, I don't know. What do you got? <laughs> and uh, you know, sometimes you sometimes you, you you don't you don't have what you need. You know, you sort of get there and you think, oh, I should have packed the mosquito repellent. You don't have it. Oh well, you do without mosquito repellent. You know, eventually you manage to get some from somewhere. But having that mind that inclines in that way, yeah? inclining towards emptiness. And of course, this was one of the great problems and still is a great problem with the perception of, of Buddhism uh, and the way it's received into the West. And of course, uh, partly because of the internal um, dialogue and dynamics in, in, in within Buddhism, but Buddhism was largely perceived as being very negative and pessimistic. And that, that was for a number of reasons. One, one reason was because <clears throat> one of the first uh, philosophers to uh, 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 sort of embrace or talk about Buddhism seriously as a philosophy was uh, Schopenhauer, the German philosopher. And uh, he, uh, he himself was quite pessimistic, so he kind of presented Buddhism in that way. So that was kind of one of the reasons it's got this kind of reputation. And... Uh, uh, and so emptiness was kind of seized upon as being this kind of nihilistic doctrine, yeah? It's a kind of nihilism, like, the, like if you talk about emptiness, it means there's nothing there. Of course, that's not what emptiness means. It's got nothing to do with that. And uh, the great, if you like, the great architect of emptiness in Buddhism uh, is the, the philosopher Nagarjuna. And uh, he was, he was a, uh, writing about the second century... AD, so maybe six or seven hundred years after the Buddha. And he's often represented as being like a kind of a nihilistic philosopher, somebody who basically refutes everything and then you just sort of wipes everything off and it just leaves you with nothing. But if you look at what Nagarjuna himself says, it's actually a little bit more subtle than that. And uh, he, he expressly uh, repudiates the idea that he's he's teaching nihilism or that he's teaching nothing, and uh, people he he sort of responds to an imaginary critic who's saying that he's destroying the four noble truths, and uh, the eightfold path, and so on. And he says, no, in fact, that that, that the way I'm teaching is the correct way of understanding the four noble truths, and uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, Nagarjuna is a very subtle philosopher and it's not easy to pin down exactly what he's saying but what he says is something like this um, if 
you assert that something exists in and of itself, then how can you say that that thing is conditioned? Okay, so this is one of his powerful arguments. And in, in, uh, in his context, he was criticizing the uh, Abhidhamma philosophers, especially of the school called Sarvastivadin. And Sarvastivadins were a school who tended to um, reify things, reify phenomena. That means that they tended to look for, um, to explain things. They said, well, there, there's an existing thing that does it. Okay? That's a very abstract way of putting it, but I'll give you a few examples. They have one, one, one of their uh, dhammas, one of their things that they talked about was the thing called prapti. Prapti means possession. Okay? So when we think about possession, so something possesses something or someone possesses something, we, don't, we think of it as a relationship between those two things. But for the Sarvasti Vardhans, there was an extra thing, a third thing called possession, which was used to explain that relationship. Yeah? This, is what, this is how they tended to think. So they tended to create more and more of these phenomena to explain... Um, uh, uh, various kinds of things in a way which, which was probably unnecessary. And so Nagarjuna was trying to criticize this point of view and in a sense what he was really getting at was, trying, was saying that you can't really capture uh, the truth in these kinds of systems. Okay? and that you can't expect to have a one-to-one -one relationship between the words that you're using and the truth that you're describing. Okay? So he said, that, like, language is provisional. And uh, so in uh, one of his basic arguments was that if you say, for example, we talk about suffering, okay, in Buddhism, you experience pain, you experience loss, you experience sadness. Now, according to the Abhidhamma systems, that suffering, that painful feeling, for example, is a thing. Okay? It exists in and of itself. And the word they use for in and of itself is swabhava. So it exists swabhava. It's an actual essence. There's an actual particular phenomenon. But you think of it like a kind of an, a, 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 an atom or something in, in chemistry. There's an atom. It's like you have a sodium atom or you know something like that. So you have a dukkha atom. Okay, you have an actual dukkha particle, right? Which which is actually what suffering is, and it exists in and of itself. And so one of it inherently exists. So one of Nagarjuna's arguments again to repeat was that if it anything inherently exists, then how can it be conditioned? Okay? So what he was pointing to was that actually our experience is, is through and through is interdependent. Okay? Nothing exists by itself. Things only exist in relationship to other things. Okay? So for example, we might experience suffering, but that suffering is not experienced as something which just sits there in the corner by itself. It's experienced in the context of our lives. Yeah? in the context of our thoughts, of our emotions, our beliefs, uh, our bodies. All of these things influence our suffering and they affect it and are affected by it. Okay? And this is this kind of web of interrelatedness which makes up our lives. And so he said that, that, that suffering doesn't exist in and of itself as kind of inherently existing thing. And so because of this... Um, uh, tendency, uh, he, he, he became accused of, a, of, a, of, a, of being a, a nihilist, but actually he, he, what he said was that if you assert existence is one extreme and non-existence is another extreme. Right? And so he taught that what he said was the middle way, which is what the Buddha taught as dependent origination. And uh, he made the equation uh, dependent origination itself is emptiness. Okay, so this is one of the very important things about Nagarjuna's philosophy. Dependent origination is emptiness. Now, the, one of the things about that is that in the Pali suttas, there's no explicit statement that says that dependent origination is emptiness. 
There's several contexts that relate them together, but there's nowhere that says explicitly that dependent origination is emptiness. But when Nagarjuna was doing that, he wasn't referring to the Pali Suttas, he was referring to the Sanskrit Agamas, it's the equivalent scriptures, and they have a slightly different phrasing, and they've actually recovered one of the manuscripts of these Sarvasivadan Agamas, and they actually have the phrase and say that dependent origination is emptiness. So what that means is that when Nagarjuna said this, he wasn't making some kind of new proposition, right? He wasn't making anything up. He was reminding his readers of what they knew already. Yeah? He was referring them back to a well-known canonical quote, which they all knew, would have been familiar with, and he was reminding them of this and then drawing out some of the implications as he saw it. This was his role. So this is why he called his school the Madhyamaka school, which is like the middle way school. And because he followed his, his philosophy right through to its uh, conclusion and uh, was very um, subtle in the way that he did that. And one of the things is that he's often said, it's often said that Nagarjuna says that Nibbana and Sangsara are the same. Okay? So this is quite challenging, like especially if you come from a Theravadan point of view, it's quite challenging, right? Nibbana, Nibbana and Sangsara are complete opposites, right? Nibbana is bliss and happiness, and Sangsara is awful and rotten and suffering, and they're completely different. There's a big line, don't, there's a fence, there's like a Berlin Wall we build. One hand is Nibbana, one hand is Sangsara. In Sangsara, you've got all these like slimy, despicable, defiled creatures who are sitting there suffering, and in Nibbana, you've got all these Arahants, and you get this kind of idea of these Arahants kind of. It's almost like this, they're kind of they're on their kind of overstuffed leather lounge chairs in Nibbana with a kind of glass of chateau de chateau to one side and puffing on their cigarettes, their no, cigars, and kind of peering down disdainfully at all of the suffering minions down in Sangsara. And, uh, that's their karma, isn't it? Oh, those, those, those defiled beings, they certainly deserve all that suffering, don't they? So this is this kind of impression that you get of the uh, the uh, selfish arahants in their nibbana, but I don't know if that's quite accurate, completely. And uh, Nagarjuna said two things about that. One thing he said is there's no visesa between nibbana and sangsara. Word visesa means distinction. Okay. There's no distinction, he didn't, which is different from saying that they're the same. If you assert that two things are the same, you're making a positive assertion between them. If you're saying there's no distinction, you're not actually saying anything about them. What you're saying is that, you could rephrase that as saying, whatever type of conceptual or analytical tool you try to use to uh, 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 divide up or separate Nibbana and Sangsara, it's always going to leak, right? Whatever kind of wall you put there, there's always going to be a little hole in that dike. And there's nothing that you can do that's going to completely seal off one from the other. Yeah? And again, this is coming back to that idea that Nibbana and Sangsara are not things that exist inherently in and of themselves. In a sense, we can only realize Nibbana because of Sangsara. So Nibbana is, in a sense, dependent on Sangsara. It's only because we suffer that we're going to practice. It's only because we practice that we can realize Nibbana. So Nibbana, in one sense, is unconditioned. On the other sense, it's something we can only realize through conditions, through practicing the Eightfold Path. So this is one of his statements. Another statement he said was that, and this one's very interesting, is that the, the first point of origination okay, of Sangsara. So just to comment here is that, that in, in, in one of the very famous statements that the Buddha made in the suttas is that we can never discern an, an, a, a first point of existence. Okay? So the, and this was a very, very famous and very important part of Buddhist philosophy. So of course most religions always start out with a creation myth. So in the beginning, right? And then God said something, something, and there was... So, so Buddhism said, the Buddha said there is that, that, that one cannot discern a first point 
Now that's a different thing from saying that there is no first point, okay? Right? He said the first point is un uh, whether there is a first point or not is unknowable. Okay? Okay? So this is a very, very subtle philosophical point. He's not taking a stand on whether there is or is not a first point in samsara, but whatever it is, it's unknowable. Now Nagarjuna, twisting that in his typical way, said that, that the first point of samsara right, would be the first point of Nibbāna. Yeah? And he uses an optative case. The first point of samsara would be the first point of Nibbāna. But of course there is no first point of samsara, or it's not knowable, right? Therefore we can't say anything. But then again, that's pointing to that relationship in a sense, yeah? We want to, on one hand, we want to divide these things up and say samsara and Nibbāna are completely different. But on the other hand, we can't help but post postulate some kind of relationship between them. If there was no samsara, then there could be no Nibbāna. Yeah? There could be nobody to, to actually practice and realize the truth. So we should be grateful to samsara. Yeah? It's given us the opportunity to practice. Both are undefiled. First point and the Nibbana law. Is that your commonality? Uh, I don't think you can say samsara is an undefiled state. First point. The first point is unknowable. The first point and the and Nibbana are the same. No, be a common factor. no, he wasn't saying that they're the same. He's saying, saying if there was a first point, then the first point of Nibbana and samsara would be the same. So, but he's not taking a stand about whether there is a first point or not. Yeah. So it, it's pointing to the the relativity of those two things. Yeah, not to the essence of what they are. So this is Nagarjuna's his whole point again and again was to to not talk about the essences of what things are, but to talk about the relationships between them. Okay, a relationship between nibbana and samsara. And this is what he meant by emptiness. Okay, it's not that. Nothing, there is nothing or nothing exists, but that things exist in relationship. And that's, actually, that's, um, that's absolutely and, and universally true of all of our experience. Okay? When we open our eyes, we see. Yeah? What is that act of seeing? Chakuncha paticha rupecha upajati chaku vinyana. Dependent on the eye and forms arises eye consciousness. Tirnang sangati paso. The three coming together is contact. Pasa pachaya vedna. Contact is a condition for feeling, and so on and so forth. That's the nature of our experience. Our experience is structured interdependently. There is the, the, the physical basis, an organic basis for consciousness. Eye, the brain, nervous system, pair of glasses, whatever. This is all here. And there's a, there's a there's a form or light or shape which is perceived as external. Consciousness arises dependent on these things, and the three coming together is like what we call contact or stimulus. Okay? That's what experience is. That's the structure of experience. So again, this is one aspect of, the, Buddha, of the, the, the middle way that the Buddha talked about. In philosophy, they talk about two, two kinds of philosophy. One is a philosophy they call realism. Another one they call idealism. Okay? So these, these terms have nothing to do with the ordinary, everyday words, realism and idealism. It's a specific philosophical doctrine. The realist doctrine means that things truly, wooly exist. Okay? That's the technical term, right? <laughs> Things truly, wooly exist in and of themselves. They are real. They exist out there, right? Okay. So this is the this is the kind of we know most commonly is the scientific materialist view. The world exists objectively out there. As the idealist view, which is that the world exists only in the mind. Okay. The, the external world doesn't exist. All we have is the internal world. Okay. So these, from a Buddhist point of view, are two extremes. The Buddhist point of view is that the world exists in relationship, okay? That our experience, the structure of our experience is relatedness. That's it. That's what we actually that's what we actually experience. And so we can't infer from that that the external world doesn't exist, nor can we infer that 
the uh, um, that the mind doesn't exist, and there's only there's only uh, physical phenomena. They're two extremes. So again, this is another meaning of emptiness in the philosophical sense: is that there is this um, what what our, our lives is, our, li- our experience is, is not uh, a bunch of things just sitting there inert, existing by themselves, but it's actually emerging through an ongoing and evolving relationship and connection. And this is, again, one of the meanings of, of emptiness. So when we can see that meaning, meaning of emptiness, that... Um, That uh, web or matrix of conditions doesn't stop. Okay, it keeps going. You know, we can even see that on a physical sense. Yeah, that the the the, the photons that reflect off our body they, they don't stop. They kind of keep going. Yeah? The the gravity waves that emerge when we move our things they keep going. What we do affects everything around us. Our breathing affects the atmosphere around us. Everything we're doing is... Very... And everything exists in this kind of relationship. And, of course, this, this, this happens uh, on a physical level. It happens on a personal level. That nothing we do, nothing we say is without consequence right? in terms of our relationship and connection with other people. Everything we do, we do will have an impact in one way or another. And that's the nature of our social life. Yeah? So in that way it happens as well. And it also happens on level of meditation, our inner consciousness. Nothing we do, nothing we think, no feeling that we have, no idea we have, no memory we have, nothing exists by itself. It only exists in relationship and connection with other things and can only be experienced in that way. So again, to come back with that, that meditation practice I mentioned earlier, that we can now sort of begin to appreciate some of the, the, uh, the depths of that practice, which sounds very simple. You know, like we say, this room is empty of elephants, right? <laughs> oh, well, empty of whatever it's empty of. What that then raises the question is, what, well, what happens if you keep on emptying? Right? Well, first of all, we'll take the elephants out, right? And then we'll take the, <laughs> the, the whatever it is. And we keep on going. What's left? Yeah? What is left? And then we keep on taking those things out that's left, and we keep on taking And what's left? And at the end of the day, of course, there's just me. I'm just sitting here, Right? And I can make my body go away. It's just my mind. It's just awareness. And that's all that's left. And what would happen if we threw that out? Yeah? And so we just have this self. And then that gets thrown out. And so, uh, uh, in that sense, uh, emptiness is uh, <clears throat> often said to be or treated as just a synonym for not-self. Okay, so it, certainly in the in the Pali suttas, emptiness and not self are basically synonyms. They basically have the same meaning. One of the uh, criticisms that Nagarjuna and the other Madhyamakas made was that they said that the early schools taught the not self of persons, but they didn't teach the not self of dhammas. What that means is. Uh, again, what I was talking about before, that they said, well, there's no Atman, there's no soul in a person, right? So I'm a person, I don't have my soul. But, but they said that all the things that make up that person have these little selves, they're called sabhavas, is the inherent essence. This is their claim, this is their criticism of the Abhidharma schools. That we don't just have one self, actually we end up with millions of them, all these little selves, there's these little, little sabhavas. Every thought we have is a little self, every feeling we have is a little self. So that might be an accurate uh, criticism of certain of the Abhidharma schools, but it's certainly not an accurate criticism if it was meant to be a criticism of the early teachings because this is specifically what the Buddha said was sabe dhamma anatta. Okay? All dhammas 
uh, without self and not self. So whatever we experience, not just our, not just our overall meanness, okay? I am me, and I don't have a self, but not just that, but every little thing that happens inside that, every feeling that we have, any thought we have, every perception we have, every little emotional twinge in our body, all of these are also not self. There's nothing permanent there, there's nothing essential. They just come and they go according to causes and conditions. And so as we practice with this, we learn to get comfortable with emptiness. And so remember again, this emptiness has this very essentially ambiguous and ambivalent nature. And that, 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 that nature is, is also ambivalent on an emotional level, that it can be seen as something good or as something bad. Yeah? So if it's your bank account, it's bad, right? <laughs> <laughs> if it's your... <laughs> unless you're a monk, in which case it's good, but it's, if it's suffering, if you're empty of suffering, then it's good. Yeah? So, if it's very important to notice that and to, to not turn emptiness. And again, one of the other things that Nagarjuna said, and this is very, very important, is that somebody who clings to emptiness itself is completely incurable. Okay? Someone who clings to emptiness is completely incurable. Right? Because, because emptiness... Is, the, is like the last medicine, right? So once, you, once they've taken that wrongly, then there's nothing you can do. So what that means is, and, and you can actually see this, and I've seen it many times in people who are practitioners, is that they get attached to an idea of not-self. They get attached to an idea of letting go. They get attached to an idea of emptiness. And that actually becomes... Uh, it's actually very damaging and it can um, overthrow common sense. Just, you know, just a simple example is one, this is a well-known example from Ajahn Chah, is, is like the monk who was, had a kuti with a, a leaking roof and uh, in the rains retreat he was sitting in his kuti and half of the, 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 the rain was coming through half of the kuti and he just sat in the other half and just said, oh, I'm practicing letting go right? and just let the water come in Oh, I'm just letting go. Yeah. Right. So this is obviously stupid, right? And this is not really letting go. So letting go doesn't mean you don't have common sense. Emptiness doesn't mean you don't have common sense. And so it's very important that you watch for this. Don't let this be a problem for you. You see, it's sometimes people who 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 take these teachings in the wrong way, and they. Uh, they start to ah oh, everything's rubbish everything you know nothing they get kind of depressed and oh, nothing's worthwhile it's all rubbish anyway. I've heard people say things like ah oh, you know one time we were discussing this in one of the monasteries I was in we were discussing whether we should do recycling or how how to manage our recycling and uh, somebody said oh why bother doing recycling you know we have nothing to do with the world out there you know we just let go of all of that stuff right. So this kind of attitude, again, this is kind of complete misunderstanding, misconstrual of the Dhamma. So emptiness, again, as my teacher said, is actually fulfillment and completion. And real appreciation of emptiness only comes when there is um, a, a, a beautiful and balanced and whole emotional sense of happiness and contentment. Okay? And when you have that sense of contentment, then you can take on board emptiness and you can distinguish between right kinds of emptiness and wrong kinds of empty emptiness. And you can actually let that kind of wash through you. You actually see, you intuit the, what's, what's right about it. And you take it on board. And then that, that actually it w doesn't make you like a kind of a, an empty desert. Okay, So there's this kind of Emptiness, which is like a desert or like a wilderness, is like a nothing. It's parched and it's dry. What it actually will do is it will give, if you have like that that um, that sense of love, that sense of joy, that sense of play, that sense of uh, compassion, then the emptiness will give a vessel for that. It provides a container for that, which is very beautiful, and it gives it all that space. 
And so you don't not just have those feelings, the positive feelings, but you have them in a very beautiful way, in a very spacious way. And this is a way that they can also come and go according to their causes and conditions. So this is the way that emptiness really should be used. It's the right, way, the right kind of emptiness. And then if you can practice like this, then uh, at the end of emptiness, or the highest kind of emptiness is even Venerable Sariputta used to often abide in uh, the attainment of emptiness. And so there's actually like a meditative absorption where you can just go into that complete emptiness of all defilements, emptiness of all suffering, emptiness of all everything, and just abide in that. So this is my little talk for you this evening on emptiness.